after the word. Long time no see, my good. Good, you're soft, man. Good. Yeah. It's been how long? I don't know. Two hours before. Okay, it's been a long time. <laughs> Call to order Grand Forks City Council meeting Monday, October 19th, 2020. Welcome everybody. Marine, roll call please. Weigel. Here. Dockler. Here. Weber. Here. Mock. Mock. Kavami. Kyle, are you on? Sandy? Here. And Veen? Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. It's not on the agenda, but unless there's an objection, I'd like to do the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, and there is hope for the liberty and All right, 1.2, Mayor's announcements. A couple of announcements today. Uh, I want to thank Public Works. I think they did a great job on the leaf pickup despite uh, 40 mile an hour winds out there. They sent us the numbers. We got 166 tons of yard waste from the yard waste sites, 135 tons with the vacuum unit. Seven tons were delivered, uh, were directly delivered by residents to the, to the site. And, 138 tons of, of leaves and debris was picked up from the gutters from the street sweeping, so that kept our kept out of our storm sewers. So that's great. Uh, I want to give a thank you to Mike Dunn and Construction Engineers. They brought me out on a tour over at the UND campus, and uh, you know it's really looking sharp. Uh, the University Drive, the Nistler Building, and then the buildings they showed me with the Chester Fritz remodel and the new Memorial Union. It's going to be something to see and a, and a huge uh, recruiting tool for future uh, students there. I had the privilege to speak with the South Forks Lions Club uh, about two weeks ago. That was a fun, entertaining morning. They treated me to breakfast. Uh, we had a nice conversation. Uh, we had a roundtable discussion last week on base retention with Senator Hovan, so I wanted to thank him for coming. And uh, all that he's done to support uh, all the Air Force bases in, in North Dakota, but especially our Grand Forks Air Force Base here. It's been a strong ally for us. Attended a ribbon cutting at the UND Steam Plant, a great public-private par uh, partnership that uh, went off without a hitch and nobody noticed a difference. So we always say when uh, the public doesn't know uh, the difference uh, when it comes to water, steam plants, and energy and all that, that, that you've done something right. So they did a great job there. Uh, lastly, I wanted to just mention, we had a, uh, a firefighter, Ron Phelps, was 84 years old. He'd worked for the fire department for 35 years and he retired uh, as the assistant fire chief. Um, he just passed away. So our thoughts and, and prayers will be with, with him and his family. Along with that, let's move on to number two, awards, presentations, appointments, and proclamations. Looks like we are gonna go into a COVID update. I'm gonna have uh, Mr. Doolett start, and then, um, and then uh, Mr. Weber had a, a team in here today, a group of interns and such. I'm gonna just say a few words. We, we're certainly having an increase, and we're all aware of that. We expect a, a bigger number coming tomorrow as well. Um, and it is quite expected, you know, there's, uh, we're very mobile, uh, group of people here in North Dakota and with the numbers being high in the west and the numbers high in the south and uh, you know record numbers uh, in Minnesota as well despite their restrictions it's been uh, you know it's a tough time and we're, we're still fighting it so we need to, to continue to keep that vulnerable population safe I think that's one of the real um, real great stats that we've seen is that our deaths have been low and our hospitalizations hospitalizations have stayed low we need to continue to do that and continue to be vigilant and, and keeping uh, our vulnerable population safe so with that Mr. Dulitz uh, Mayor Botensky, members of the council, I'm Michael Dulitz. Um, I uh, assist with our data and analytics at Grand Forks Public Health. I'm just going to give a quick uh, COVID update. I'm going to go a little bit more with my uh, previous uh, style, um, you know, just taking a quick look at our graphs. Uh, so looking at the one-week change, uh, so I added a one-week change on to our health officer risk score. Um, so we've had a pretty hefty increase in the number of cases. Uh, last week when I provided an update, um, our new cases were at about 
uh, 54 cases per 100,000. Now we're at 88 uh, cases per 100,000 um, in just one week's time. Um, fortunately, we have had a slight increase in our testing, um, but we've also had an increase in our percent positivity as well. Um, our percent change actually stayed right about the same, um, as well as our hospital capacity. Um, looking at our new case rate trend, um, we have had a pretty um, uh, hefty increase. Um, so looking at the percent change, we talked about it being about 58.5%, and that is a good indicator of the slope of the line. Um, so we are um, approaching right about where we were um, about a month and a half ago when we had that large on-campus outbreak. And then when we compare to other counties in North Dakota, again, Burley Morton is still ahead of us. Um, and uh, they are um, kind of been the one that, that has been um, pushing the numbers up in the state. Uh, they did go over 130 cases per 100,000 per day. And um, that's about 120,000 people in that um, Burley Morton area. And so, um, you know, they're they're averaging about 150 plus cases per day um, in that Burley Morton County area. Uh, we're following the trajectory uh, more akin to Ward County and Cass County, um, and then uh, the state of North Dakota as well, uh, that last line. Looking at our percent positivity, we have had a pretty significant increase in our percent positivity in the past week. Uh, we are getting close to uh, 10%. If we hit 10%, uh, then we will hit um, into the next highest level um, on the uh, dashboard, and so we would end up moving up into red. Uh, right now, um, we were at about 9%. We did drop slightly today. Comparing that to other counties in the state, uh, other counties are seeing a lot higher percent positivity than we are. So our peer counties, um, we are the lowest among our peer counties. Um, they have uh, all crossed that 10% um, that 10 rate. Um, so if they were using the same methodology, they would be in red right now um, if we looked at the same kind of criteria. And then finally, the state of North Dakota um, as well is looking at getting close to that 10% positivity rate. Uh, looking at um, looking at the number of tests completed, um, I have the wrong header on there. Looking at the number of tests completed, uh, we still remain strong in our testing program, um, only second to the Burley Martin area, which um, they have they're similarly as aggressive with testing and having regularly scheduled testing events and things of that nature. Um, and then we are um, above average for the state. Uh, looking at this increase um, in the in, over the past week, uh, we have had two age groups that have been kind of driving the increase, the 20 to 29 age group. So kind of what I uh, lump into as being kind of the college age group, um, given the constraints of the data. And then the um, 30 to 59 age group, which I kind of look at as the, um, the working individuals or the um, you know working age group. Um, they've both been kind of the drivers of the increase. Fortunately, we have seen an, a decrease in the six 60 plus age group. Um, we did have one death, unfortunately, in the past week, um, but uh, we have seen a decrease in our hospitalizations, which I will show on another slide. Uh, one unfortunate trend that we have seen in the past week is an increase in that 0 to 19 age group, um, and a good share of that being in the less than 17 age group. There was kind of a big increase over the weekend. Looking at our hospitalization rate, uh, Grand Forks is below um, is below Burley Morton as well as Ward, uh, but we are above Cass County. So uh, looking at that in uh, real numbers, we're averaging about seven active hospitalizations per day for individuals um, with Grand Forks County as their county of residence. Um, All true, as of today, had about 15 individuals uh, with COVID-19 who were hospitalized. Um, and then, uh, again, I had mentioned earlier, we have seen a decrease in that 60 plus age group, which is kind of bucking the trend that we've been seeing in uh, other communities or our other peer communities. Um, I know the um, increase in the 60 plus age group did have a pretty significant impact on, um, on Valley Senior Living, for instance, um, but they um, are now on the downswing as well. Um, you know, this is in contrast to other parts of the state where they're seeing um, every single resident in a nursing home be positive. Um, we have heard reports of 100% positivity in nursing homes. 
Uh, and then finally, uh, comparing to our neighboring states in the region um, and province, um, Grand Forks in South Dakota, or, uh, sorry, North Dakota and South Dakota have kind of followed the same trajectory as well as Grand Forks County. And then uh, Minnesota, though they have had a, a high rate, um, they haven't um, really uh, matched the increases that we've seen. And then Manitoba, again, uh, remains very low. Um, I do have some additional slides that I have added to the um, agenda, um, so you can feel free to review those at your convenience. Uh, with that, I am open to any questions. Any questions uh, for Mr. Doolitz? Mr. Weber, please. I may, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Um, one of the things you discussed was uh, hospitalization rates. Uh, we tend to focus just on available beds. Um, I'm going to ask a couple things. Can you talk about the overall rate for beds across the state? Because just discussing availability in, in our hospitals. Um, I, I spoke with a graduate student after class last week who is a healthcare worker in, in Minnesota. And they have beds available, but their staffing is, is becoming increasingly stressed uh, with people working 100 hour weeks, um, round the clock shifts, things of that sort. And regardless of what our local capacity is, we have to think about our capacity regionally because I believe that we're taking patients from the region. We may have to send patients regionally. Could you discuss some of that in relation to hospitalization rates? So looking at our staffed beds in Grand Forks right now, as of 1250 today, Ultra reported out one staffed ICU bed and six staffed inpatient beds. Again, that's a number that's always in fluctuation um, as, you know, as you look at uh, hospital status, but that's our good picture of their status right now. Um, you know, as we look at the other large hospitals in the state, um, I did, you know, kind of quickly count out the numbers. Um, so at the hospitals in the four large communities, we have between 15 and 20 ICU beds and about 200 hospital beds. Um, the state strategy, um, the state health council met last week, so this is all information that they, um, that I picked up from there. The state strategy right now is to try and fill up, um, you know, hospital beds throughout the state to try and kind of maximize the allocation of beds, um, you know, with the available staffing that we have across the state. So um, hospitals have been a little bit more proactive than they have before about um, transferring people to a lower level of or not a lower level of care, but a, another level of care in like a critical access hospital that may have up to 25 beds that um, are likely underutilized. So uh, they've been moving people into swing bed um, programs there um, because the other kind of limiting step we have is um, you know, like nursing homes aren't taking patients too. So then that kind of clogs up the system so you don't necessarily have that throughput. So there's a lot of factors that kind of, you know, add up to create difficulty for hospital systems that go just beyond having an average of seven COVID hospitalizations from Grand Forks County in the past week. So Uh, Council Member Weber, um, that that actually would probably be you know the 14% number that you gave. I you know um, I mentioned that we have about 250-ish beds in the state, so that's probably not too far off. Um, a 14% availability rate, um, even in a normal time, may actually not be that far off of par for the course. Um, you know, and that you know. The big question is, do you have the right bed available at the right time, the right place, with the right staff? And so that might be, that's the part that's a little more nuanced. So we wouldn't want 100% availability. That means our hospitals aren't, Yeah, we're, we're overbuilt uh, on our hospital capacity. Yeah. So actually you're saying 18% is, is not necessarily alarming. It's not necessarily alarming. Um, you know, in my previous work, I worked in a hospital. Um, and there were times that, you know, even, you know, without COVID that we would be backed up into the emergency department with beds. Um, you know, right now the advantage that, you know, the disadvantage we have is the pandemic. The advantage we have is um, we're being a little bit more strategic on a statewide basis on allocating beds and stuff like that. 
that said, it feels really miserable for the person waiting in the hospital bed or waiting in the ER bed for hours um, waiting for a bed. But um, there, are, there are a lot of actions being taken. It's uncomfortable, but there are actions being taken as well. Very good. That, that's very helpful and, and even reassuring to some extent. Um, are, is anyone tracking uh, uh, staff capacity uh, at our hospitals across the state? Uh, I would imagine that that would be a pretty, uh, you know, the the state um, would have some um, would have some bearing on what the staffing is like because they're the ones that are getting requests from the state. Uh, currently, the state is working on trying to decrease the number of nurses doing the testing events, the COVID testing events, and move EMS providers into those positions because they have a number of individuals who um, are working for the state as nurses that they could be putting into long-term care settings, they could be putting into other hospital settings to help fill gaps. And so they are getting those risk requests, so they would have a, you know, a relatively good idea on uh, where those needs are. That's just not something that you know, they regularly you know, discuss publicly or anything like that. Um, as always, thanks for your work. Uh, much appreciated. And thanks for taking my questions. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, anybody on Zoom got a question? I want to forget about you guys. All right. Thank you, Mr. Dulitz. Oh, yeah. uh, how is the workload for contact tracers and um, Department of Health folks? Are we fully staffed? Uh, so contact tracing wise, um, this past weekend was pretty difficult statewide with the number of cases that we had. Um, and so it has been kind of taxing on the contact tracing infrastructure. Um, so statewide, it got you know, fairly behind, um, especially the counties that use the, you know, 100% state contact tracers because they, they can't augment with local capacity. This weekend we were doing a really good um, good job at keeping up in Grand Forks. Uh, we have the recent uh, recently added advantage of having the UND specific contact tracing team. They've, you know, they've really kind of um, come up into the, um, into that position well. Um, a lot of the cases we have been seeing are in that 20 to 29 age group and so they're taking anybody aged 18 to 24 as well as anybody um, otherwise known to be affiliated with UND like an employee or something like that which has really helped. Um, and then we also have uh, UND's student contact tracers um, that have been helping in the Grand Forks area as well as our own contact tracers. So um, we have been doing a good job at keeping up. Uh, unfortunately, um, you know, uh, what will be reported out tomorrow is about 173 new cases, and so we are in a little bit of a, a little bit more bind today. Um, but uh, um, every indication that I've gotten is that we are keeping up relatively well. Uh, as a state, we're doing about 95% um, of cases are being reached within 24 hours, but that was as of last week. And do we know why we are seeing such a jump tomorrow? Uh, it, the best indication that I have um, for tomorrow is uh, there was a UND testing event on Saturday. Those results came as well as um, kind of our um, increased results that we've been seeing through the all true drive through testing. Um, those are kind of the, you know, the main drivers. And then there were a couple of small testing events that kind of worked their way in, um, you know, so like, um, you know, nursing home group facilities, things like that, that also um, did contribute to today's number. I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor, if I may. Mr. Weber, please. Uh, 178 new cases will be reported out tomorrow. 173. <laughs> Very good. I, I, know, I, know. <laughs> I didn't mean to exaggerate. Yeah. 173, uh, not a laughing matter. Um, and what was the, uh, the, the testing capacity on Saturday? Uh, I don't have that number off the top of my head. You mentioned earlier 10%. Uh, uh, of course, we, we never want to look at just a single day because we can have spikes for different reasons. But we look at that seven-day average. And we've been very, very close, getting closer to that 10% kind of tipping point. Can, can you discuss the significance of the 10% tipping point in terms of uh, positivity rates? So in terms of positivity rates, so um, you know, the way the dashboard um, is kind of designed is you have to 
have um, you have to have be in red in three areas plus have either a decrease in testing or a hospital impact for us to go into red as um, you know on the dashboard and so we do have a small hospital impact we will be in red going over the 10 percent positivity and so if um, if the positivity rate um, it, you know goes higher than 10% um, on average over the past week then we would be in red um, you know I you may infer that we could end up going over that 10% rate you know I'm not sure until I see the testing numbers I don't have that for sure so um, I can't um, you know I can't guess I guess That's, that, that is concerning all right thank you mr. Dulitz. thank you any other questions for mr. Dulitz? All right, moving on, we're going to go. We have a UND Hugo City Research Partnership Group. I think it's been a, a great collaborative effort here. Um, I guess, Mr. Weber, could you lead into us and give us a little idea about how this got started and who's going to be presenting today, and then we'll let them take over. Uh, sure. This is, uh, was started by Hugo's uh, in, t in town here. Um, uh, the, the study began uh, before they had their uh, mask requirement in their stores. Uh, this evening, uh, several months of research is being presented, uh, specifically uh, the over 16,000 observations that they made uh, from parking lots uh, students made. So the, the presentation is uh, by four of the, the students. There have been a total of six. Uh, these have been public health and uh, social work students, uh, graduate and undergraduate students. Uh, they'll be leading and they're uh, backed up by uh, some uh, public health and social work faculty uh, that make up the uh, the current research team. Thank you, Mayor. All right, guys, go ahead. All right, well, I'll get us started. Um, good evening, Mayor Bo Chensky, Council President Sandy, members of City Council, and the broader Grand Forks community. I will start by introducing myself. My name is Courtney Lieben, and I'm a senior at UND, majoring in social work and minoring in special education. My name is Haley Bushy, and I am a senior graduating in December, majoring in social work and minoring in chemical dependency. My name is Emily Passes, and I am a senior at UND in the public health education program. We were having a little trouble hearing whoever was whoever just went. Delton, you may be on mute. There you go. <laughs> My name is Delton Gable, and I am a senior majoring in public health education and biology. All right. We would like to thank the mayor and members of the council for including us on the itinerary tonight, as well as Hugo's UND public health and the city of Grand Forks for providing us with this partnership opportunity. We are here tonight to present observational and survey data that was collected this summer during phase one of an interdisciplinary mask research project. This study is part of a larger multi-method action research project engaging UND based researchers, including students to collect and share local data to promote community health in the face of the pandemic. Next slide, please. The purpose of our study is as follows. In a partnership between UND, the City of Grand Forks, Public Health, and Hugo's, we are conducting an IRB-approved research project on face mask usage in Grand Forks. Our data will be used in our city's continued efforts to navigate the COVID-19 pandemic. Through observational data, survey data, and interview data, the purpose of this study is to inform public health messages and promote protective behaviors until a vaccine is available. The use of face masks is a highly contentious issue in North Dakota and the United States. That being said, the use of face masks is highly recommended by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention to protect individual health and community health by reducing the spread of COVID-19. Tonight, we are here to present data from this larger study that began on May 14th. It is important to note that the observational data shared with you tonight was collected prior to Hugo's decision to implement mask usage within their stores. 
This information is not generalizable to all places and businesses, but serves a beneficial purpose in aiding our community's continued COVID-19 prevention and response efforts. Next slide. As stated before, this is an ongoing project that is comprised of phases. Phase one began with observations and surveys. Observations of face mask usage were collected from the Hugo's clientele throughout the five Grand Forks and East Grand Forks locations. Individuals observed were divided into four age categories. Children ages zero to 17, young adults ages 18 to 40, middle-aged ages 41 to 64, and senior ages 65 plus. Survey QR codes were given out in grocery bags at checkout and advertised on city information and Hugo social media pages. We are currently in phase two and are in the process of conducting interviews with key informants in the Grand Forks community. The second aspect of phase two is break, brings all of us here tonight. We are here to share information we have collected in hopes that it will guide further public health discussions and promotions for our community. Next slide, please. Now Emily and I will take some time to share our personal observation experiences. The first time I observed was during one of the busiest shifts from 4 to 6 p.m. There were few people wearing masks on this first day. After weeks of sitting in a hot car during all times of the day, I observed more and more people wearing masks. From my experience, people often walk up to the stores with their masks in their hands and put it on right before entering. The further along we got in the study, the more interesting the data became. It was apparent that as the weeks progressed, a larger percentage of people were wearing masks. Another unique experience I had was sitting in the, alone in the car for eight to 10 hours a week. It felt very isolating and I often found myself getting lost in thought. Just like everyone else, I was struggling not to have as much human interaction. While a research project like this generally would be done in teams, I very, was very much missing this aspect. We would try to communicate through texts or calls during our observations, giving the feeling of working more as a team. Having other students doing the observations with me was always better than doing a store by myself. Delton and I observed many stores together over the summer, texting back and forth from across the parking lot, talking about the experience. As he said, we experienced hotter than hot days where we would have to turn on our cars every 15 minutes to circulate some cold air through the car just so that we wouldn't have to waste gas by leaving our car on for the full two-hour shift. Observations got harder when it rained. Shoppers were bundled up in windbreakers and tucking their chins in their chests, and you could barely see their faces, let alone if they were wearing a mask while they sprinted from their cars to the entrance. We could have as many as 400 people recorded in the two-hour time frame and recording up to five separate people walking into the same door at the same time was really challenging. Having had this experience, I feel like I've seen the people of Grand Forks in a new light. It was absolutely hilarious to see some of the things people deemed acceptable to be worn as masks. I once saw a middle-aged woman wrap her entire head in a sweatshirt, only leaving her eyes visible. But by far the funniest thing to observe were all the middle-aged to senior men that would exit the store, pause directly in front of the door, and dramatically rip off their mask uh, their, and take a deep breath of relief as if it were the biggest inconvenience in the world. Overall, it was a very rewarding experience to take part in because of all of us observers finally started to see more and more masks being worn. Next slide, please. This slide is a general overview of our observations from June 22nd to July 28th. The groups observed were children, zero to age 17, YA or young adults, 18 to 40, MA or middle-aged adults, 41 to 64, and seniors, which are 65 plus. The table shows the raw number of individuals observed wearing face coverings or no face coverings along with the percentage to the right. Between the five Hugo's locations in Grand Forks and East Grand Forks, we observed individual mask usage for approximately 144 hours over 72 shifts. These observations were recorded by five student observers who sat in their personal vehicle. All observations were done in observance of COVID-19 protocols with no direct contact. Our observations concluded on July 28th. This was the day before Hugo's chose to implement mask usage in their stores. The information we are sharing with you today is from approximately 16,000 individuals that were observed during that time period. As you can see on this slide, over the course of the six weeks, 52% of females and 41% of males chose to wear a mask.
This slide is a weekly comparison of our observations. On the left-hand side of the table is the weeks, and on the top row is the face covering number of individuals and percentage in parentheses. As you can see from the data, mask usage continued to increase throughout the duration of the six weeks of observations. Face masks were worn 35% of the time in week one, 36% of the time in week two, almost 40% in week three, 42% in week four. We observed a significant increase in week five when on July 20th, Hugo's announced that they would require face masks to be worn starting July 29th. So as you can see on the slide, we saw this an increase from 42% to 64% and 75% once the mask requirement was announced, even though it was not implemented. This next table breaks down our observations by week and by age of the individuals observed. On the left-hand side of the table, data is broken into rows for each of the six weeks of observations that started on June 22nd and concluded on July 28th. On the right-hand side, you see that, that the columns are separated into children, young adults represented by YA, middle aged represented by MA, and seniors. You can see from the data that there was an all-around increase in mask usage across the board from week one of observations to week six. In comparison, from week one to week six, we see a 50% increase in children wearing masks, a 40% increase in young adults, a roughly 50% increase in middle-aged adults, and a 40% increase of seniors wearing masks. According to our results, by week six, more than two-thirds of young adults were wearing masks before Hugo's chose to make them make them a requirement in their stores. And it is most important to note that seniors lead in mask usage. As seen in the last column of the table in the first and last rows, starting week one at 52% mask usage and ending week six at 89.7% mask usage. Next slide, please. On this slide, we will share our observational results regarding gender and face mask usage. This chart is broken down into week by week results from June 22nd to July 28th, as noted on the left-hand column. You can see the individual weeks. Observers recorded males and females of all age groups into categories of wearing a face mask or not wearing a face mask. According to the results, females of all ages led in mask usage. In fact, as you can see on week six of the data, 80.7% of females chose to wear face masks before they were required by Hugo's. Following close behind, on July 27th and 28th, nearly 70% of males also chose to wear masks in comparison to the first week of the study, June 22nd to 28th, when male face mask usage was at 30%. This shows that from July 20th to July 28th, the vast majority of were wearing masks voluntarily. Next slide, please. Here you can see a weekly breakdown of our data by age and gender. Over three-fourths of female young adults were wearing masks on July 27th and 28th and a little over two thirds of young adult males were wearing masks on those same days. 93% of female senior adults and 87% of male senior adults were choosing to wear masks on July 27th and 28th as well. In short, only a range of seven to 13% of individuals observed male or female from the senior age category were not voluntarily wearing masks on those two days. It should be noted that our results display that the number of mask wearers remains high across all observed ages, male and female. This is not a debate between young versus old or male versus female. As Emily previously stated, one of our methods consisted of a survey. Once again, the purpose of this research study provides an opportunity to learn more about the use of face coverings in response to the transmission of COVID-19 and help local officials and local businesses develop effective public health messages that resonate with our own community. This survey was conducted online and participants received flyers with a URL and a QR code so that they could access the survey with either. The questions asked on the survey consisted of, do you wear a mask in public settings? 
How satisfied or dissatisfied are you with education or information on the use of mass? And most people who are important to me, for example, parents, partner, friends, community leaders, etc., approve of mass wearing in public settings. The benefit of completing the survey was that the respondents would be contributing to the development of knowledge on the use of face coverings in the midst of COVID-19. These individuals were also contributing to efforts to create effective public health messages and how to broadly spread knowledge of COVID-19. Next slide, please. These are our survey results. The data used for these graphs were obtained from 1,444 respondents. The top graph indicates the influence of key figures in a person's life regarding their decisions about whether or not to wear a mask. The bottom of the first graph reads as whether respondents agree nor disagree, disagree and agree. The right side indicates the respondents' frequency of mask use. These results suggest that people are more or less likely to mask up depending on the behaviors of leaders or other key influencers in their lives. Importantly, they are more likely to wear a mask when they see people they respect also wearing a mask. The bottom graph shows the level of satisfaction with information and or education with face covering use. The bottom shows neither satisfied nor dissatisfied dissatisfied and satisfied. On the right hand side, it shows wearing a face covering never, sometimes and most often to always. The results show that individuals who were satisfied with information and education were more likely to wear a face covering. On the contrary, those that reported dissatisfaction with information and education were less reported to wear face coverings as frequently. Next slide, please. As far as next steps, we will continue the phase two interviewing process. We have also applied to expand this study from the Grand Forks community to the entire state of North Dakota and are awaiting IRB approval for this step. We have submitted an abstract to present at the 2021 Dakota Rural and Public Health Conference. And we are currently in the process of creating publications with the survey and observ observational data we have collected so far. We will return in the future when we have more data to share with you all. Next slide, please. We will, now share, we will now share our key findings from the data shared with you all tonight. Observations revealed differences in face mask behavior across gender and age groups. As you can see on the slide, women were more likely than men to wear masks. Seniors 65 plus were the most likely to wear masks. Over two thirds of young adults ages 18 to 40 were observed wearing masks voluntarily and over the six weeks of data collection, all observed groups had increased face covering usage. However, face mask behavior increased for all groups over time as the deadline approached for Hugo's implementation of a face mask requirement for customers. Although the increase was shown, overall young men were the least likely to wear a mask, followed by middle-aged men and young adult women. We hope our data was beneficial to those listening tonight and and we would again like to reiterate that this is not a debate between male versus female and young versus old, but rather a call to action that future interventions should emphasize face mask health promotion and education materials that promote face mask behavior among diverse groups. Next slide, please. Lastly, we want to leave you with our four important takeaways. Leaders have greater influence on behavior than they may realize. Hugo's leadership and their requirement seems to have had a direct impact on getting more people to wear masks. City government needs to continue and improve support for key stakeholders like UND and Altru. And finally, preventing COVID-19 is a shared responsibility. Thank you again for your time and to our partners in this study. With this, we will open the floor for questions. And it's, uh, it's been a challenge, as you know, to try to get people to do that. Um, I don't, uh, 
I don't get to talk to college students as often as, as probably a professor would, so I, I did have one question for you guys, and maybe you can help shed some light on that. How have you kind of noticed, you know, in the public we can view that and we can see if people are wearing masks. How have you noticed uh, mask usage in, in gatherings and in private residence when people come together when they're, when they're not in public? What have you guys noticed in, in your circles? Yeah, I guess I can go. Um, from my experience, um, like clubs and organizations, um, other just gatherings have all required masks um, at their events. You know, uh, starting with the school year, I know like fraternity and sorority recruitment all required them. Um, more formal events have required them as well, you know, like clubs or other activities. Um, as far as the individuals having events at their private residence, um, I know in the, the college age demographic, there have been less and less people that have been wearing them um, in those private settings, which has increased the number of individuals in that age demographic to have contracted the virus. Um, I can add on to what uh, Delton had said. So just to reiterate, um, we all think that um, the university has done a really great job um, in their position on COVID related issues. Um, in addition to that, um, the use of face masks clearly has um, increased, especially as shown by our data today. But um, in my personal opinion, just that influence factor um, is such a beneficial thing. Um, my friend groups, all of us have begun to wear it to the point where you don't even notice if um, anybody is anymore. So just increasing that continuous norm normalcy of um, wearing a mask in public. So what would you guys contribute the spread to that's happening on campus? As they've, they've gone from, I think they were down to 30, now it's over 100 again. Well, if you guys had to, to pin down, where can we be better? That is a, a tough question. Um, I think a lot of it, it comes from the, the gathering of individuals, whether it's at like bars or restaurants in town, um, just choosing to, to go to those places without a mask has, without a mask has um, definitely spread. And, you know, even if you are being personally safe, um, you know, paying for your education, so you want to go to those classes in person and the person next sitting next to you or in the same classroom as you could not be taking the same precautions that you are taking and you can end up catching it from them. So I think having a, uh, a position where people realize the benefits of having a mask um, on in those locations can decrease the spread is is a key factor. All right, thank you. I'd open it up to any council members that would like to ask me Mayor, questions. Mayor, I've got comments. just two quick questions, yep. if you don't mind. Mr. Rigo, please. Uh, just real quick, it's kind of a two-part question, but one, what are you guys seeing as students regarding we've talked a lot about masks and COVID and, and positivity rate what are you guys seeing on the mental health side because I, I think that's oftentimes the most forgotten thing um, that we don't talk about enough is is the mental health of, of children mental health of college students and mental health of um, some of the older adults and uh, I'll ask that question and then on the last slide there was a uh, something that said the city can continue to support and improve communication or something along those lines. What are some of those things that the city can do to improve um, what you guys what you guys need at the university? Or some ideas maybe. Emily and uh, Haley haven't answered any questions yet, so I'm gonna leave it to one of them. I would say on the mental health aspect of the question that I've noticed within myself and peers in my classes that 
being on Zoom is a lot tougher than you'd think, like, you just have to show up and be there, but there's an aspect of we don't really get that in class and person-to-person um, -person experience, so that definitely is weighing on our mental health, but at, at the same time, it's also necessary that we, we can't meet in class like we would normally. I only have one class um, that meets in person on class on campus and it is optional and masks are required um, so whenever I get the chance I do try to attend that um, just to get that person-to-person uh, -person aspect but I do definitely think that having class on zoom has been beneficial to stopping the majority of the spread of the virus I would have to agree with Emily on that and UND has done a great job of providing different resources for the students on campus. And I personally don't have classes on campus this semester since I'm in my internship and that is all virtual. So I can't talk too much on that part of it, but I do feel like UND is doing a great job of providing resources to the students that do go on campus. And then does anybody have anything for that second question I put out there, how the city can improve with UND? I forgot what the slide specifically said, if somebody wants to read that back. Yeah, so um, basically what the slide says is just city government. Um, our, our key takeaway kind of was that the city government um, needs to continue and, and improve support for key stakeholders like UND and Altru. Um, and what we're looking for, I guess, is just um, continued promotion and, uh, you know, you guys promoting the face coverings to students and other members of the community, giving them the opportunity to see the benefits of them, you know, you know keeping the dashboard up to date, which you guys are doing a fantastic job of. Um, uh, other things like that. Um, Tannis, if you want to jump in real quick and give some more. Of course, I'm a professor. I always like to talk, right? <laughs> That's why I've been muted. Um, so I don't want to take the spotlight away from the students. They did a tremendous job. Um, I think with what UND has done in terms of requiring face uh, masks and what we saw, I think the, the really important takeaway about Hugo's data, we observed for four weeks. We observed um, over 16,000 individuals in Grand Forks and East Grand Forks, and we haven't looked at the data by store yet, but we plan to do that as well to get other differences by, by demographics and who lives around those stores and uses those stores. Um, but it hovered right around 30 and 40 percent for four weeks. Then all of a sudden on July 20th, the article came out in the Herald that Hugo's was requiring it. They probably increased their signage. We don't have data to support that, um, that they were going to require it starting on the 29th. And then all of a sudden we saw 25%, 15% increase in face coverings. And so having um, you know, that mandate, that requirement on, from Hugo's in public spaces, um, you know, there's a lot of um, publicity. You know, Minnesota has a mask mandate, yet they have seen increasing cases. Well, those are coming from personal gatherings and social gatherings. You know, they're not happening at the stores where masks are required. They're occurring where people are congregating and having, um, you know, no more than 10 people in gatherings or 50 people in gatherings are really tightening up um, the number of people. Manitoba requires no more than five people per gathering right now, as of today um, in Manitoba. They had more than that and they just dropped it to five um, individuals gathering at a time, wearing mace, uh, face masks whenever you're with individuals. So um, those types of precautions, I think, getting to what we were talking about. You any other uh, council member comments? We'll see if there's anybody else, and we'll let Preco at the end here. <laughs> anybody else on Zoom that wanted to chime in? Mr. Bean. I'll just please. make, uh, well, start out with one comment. I, I, I heard them say that they, they're looking for leadership to set, step forward. And, and Mayor, you've been wearing a mask for a long time. The governor wears a, a, almost all the meetings that I've been with him. I appreciate the leadership that's showing there. I think we've shown some leadership here with the city council too. Uh, 
I especially look out at the audience here, and everybody's wearing masks. It's been that way for a couple of meetings now. So I'm hoping that that is helpful. But what's concerning is our numbers are still going the wrong direction. And so, although we're doing some things well, it's obvious we're not doing enough to get our numbers in order. And I'm concerned about what's going to happen as winter comes on and there's more indoor. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, and we really want to figure out the policy that keeps schools open, keeps businesses open, all of that that we need to take a look at. So I found the information today was really helpful. And I think it's something that I certainly want to digest more as we go forward. Thank you. I think that was really well put. Mr. Weber, the floor is yours. Well, very good. Um, uh, thanks. Uh, first of all, uh, it's worth noting this is a really unique study. Um, I speak with friends and family uh, across North America, even, even in Europe, and one of the first things we talk about is how many people are wearing masks in your community? What are you seeing there? And it's a, a topic of discussion, but as, as Rob Port has recently noted, no one has actually gone out and done the counting. Uh, this was a study done over five weeks of direct observations, over 16,000 individuals observed and recorded. Um, and uh, this is, uh, again, a, a unique study. There are uh, not empirical studies of this kind out, out there. Um, one of the findings, uh, young adult males who often kind of portrayed as, as, as being uh, anti-mask or, or less likely to wear masks, even among that group, uh, two-thirds of them were wearing masks before it was required at, at Hugo's. Uh, and, and a key part of that, and Mr. Vian has just mentioned it, um, the role of um, key influencers in their lives, uh, leaders, role models, etc., uh, depending on what uh, the attitude of those individuals is about mask wearing tends to impact uh, all of our behaviors, but especially uh, uh, young adult uh, behaviors. Uh, and uh, actually, what I've heard from all the school teachers in the school district is the kids have been great about wearing masks, and that's not even been an issue at all. Um, it's uh, uh, worth noting that, that requirements like the, the one that Hugo's, uh, in, in, you know, uh, put in place, those requirements affect behaviors. Uh, that seems to be a key takeaway here. And while we've been talking, my, my text, my, I, I didn't mean to be playing with my phone, but it was just doing it. I was getting a number of text messages. Apparently Fargo's uh, Mayor Mahoney has uh, passed a, a mayoral uh, mask mandate down in Fargo. So um, I fear that uh, going back to the summer when our rates were, were very, very low, we, uh, we may have missed the opportunity to impact more far-reaching prevention efforts, and now uh, we're faced with having to deal with the far more expensive uh, disaster mitigation. Um, and uh, hopefully we're not having to, getting forced to uh, do more shut in, shutdown of our economy, but it feels like the goalposts have been moving. Um, we keep changing the dashboard so uh, it, it, it doesn't look as bad. We uh, move the requirements for our restart, uh, and, and I, I'm troubled by that. Um, bottom line for me after all of that is, while masks are one tool for prevention, um, uh, they are just a tool. Uh, when you have to go out, when you have to be in, in, in gatherings, in indoor spaces with crowds of people, Please wear a mask, everyone here is. But we also, at least for the, the near future, need to be looking very hard at when is it absolutely necessary to have a gathering of this sort? Is it still essential for everyone to be here in person? Or can more and more of our business, at least while we're dealing with these uh, dramatic spikes, can more and more of that be done uh, virtually? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And thank you for uh, allowing the, the students to make the presentation this evening. And thank you to the students and uh, the faculty member there. Definitely good work. Uh, all right, moving on, 2.2, Mr. Grasser, Red River Basin Commission. All right, thank you. Mayor, members, city council, uh, new subject matter. <laughs> We're going to talk a little bit tonight about uh, an organization that the city is part of called the Red River Basin Commission. Uh, 
I'm not going to talk too much about it. There's a short little video in here that, that kind of gives the background of what the organization is about. Uh, I will say that I'm, I'm proud uh, and privileged to represent the city of Grand Forks on that board uh, by appointment uh, from, from Mayor Bochinski. Uh, and with that, uh, again, we'll have a quick video. And then if there's any questions after the video, uh, I can try to answer any of those questions. The Red River Basin Commission is a nonprofit organization with offices in both the United States and Canada, working across the political boundaries of Manitoba, Minnesota, North Dakota, and South Dakota. Since its inception, the Basin Commission has become an international effort to establish a common vision, to share resources and responsibilities, and to create a unified voice on regional priorities. The Red River Basin is an international watershed situated in the Northern Great Plains, which encompasses 45,000 square miles or 116,000 square kilometers. 80% of the basin lies in the United States, with 18 Minnesota counties and 22 North Dakota counties lying wholly or partially within the basin. The other 20% includes 48 municipalities in Manitoba, Canada. The area is home to nearly 1.5 million people and serves as an employment, education, and medical hub. In addition to being a world-renowned agricultural producer, not only is the basin's geography complex, but so are the economic, social, and governmental aspects of the region. The population is shifting from rural to urban settings, creating strain not only on rural areas that are losing their citizens, but also on growing cities that need to find ways to provide water and services to an expanding populace. Also, the jurisdictions within the basin are in different states and even different countries. As a result, there are differing laws, policies, and even priorities that make it difficult to create consistency in managing land and shared water resources. The Red River Basin Commission assists in forming relationships and facilitates discussions across the region to find solutions to common problems. It has a vision where basin residents organizations, and governments work together to achieve region-wide commitment to comprehensive, integrated watershed stewardship and management. If you are interested in learning more about the Red River Basin Commission or any of the topics covered in this video, please check our website and social media pages that also was, for additional uh, videos geared towards uh, promoting cattails and then try, trying to uh, document and research how much phosphorus and nitrogen and things you could, you could pull out of the uh, system uh, with the cattails. We could watch some more, but I think we'll cut that off. So that was my rambling uh, rendition of, of the audio. It, it sounded better uh, when it was scripted. I apologize for that, but are there any questions? Again, we're we're, we're a member of that commission. Um, it, it, it it's it's kind of neat. You can see in the commissions, it's it's kind of a, a futuristic look to me sometimes on regulations and things that might be coming down the pike five and ten years uh, from now. Yeah, you can see the formulative stages of them uh, beginning uh, almost at this organizational level. So again, it's grassroots. They get a lot of uh, input directly from. Uh, just people. Any questions from council? Mr. Bean? That's kind of your subject. Yeah, I've, I've met many meetings with Mr. Grasser before. I, I know what's going on. And I, I think it's a lot of work being done behind the scenes, but uh, I thank Mr. Grasser for contributing and being a part of that, uh, representing the city of Grand Forks. Uh, one of the things that they've been looking at is, is just water. Uh, 
a water quality and quantity study that they do. It's been part of what we've looked at as a part of the Red River Valley water supply project. So we've been working quite closely with that group. It's been very beneficial. So thanks. Any other questions? Well, thank you. Okay. I think it was a good appointment, so I'm excited. For thank you. you. <laughs> All right, 2.3, pro proclamation. I'll try to get through this uh, extra mile day. <clears throat> extra mile day, November 1st, 2020. Grand Forks, or whereas Grand Forks, North Dakota is a community that acknowledges that a special vibrancy exists within the entire community when its individual citizens collectively go the extra mile in a personal effort, volunteerism, and service. And whereas Grand Forks, North Dakota is a community that encourages its citizens to maximize their personal contribution to the community by giving themselves wholeheartedly and total, with total effort, commitment, and conviction to their individual ambitions, family, friends, and community. And whereas Grand Forks, North Dakota is a community that chooses to shine a light and celebrate individuals and organizations within its community who go the extra mile in order to make a difference and lift up fellow members of their community. And whereas Grand Forks, North Dakota acknowledges the mission of the Extra Mile America to create 500 Extra Mile cities and states in America and is proud to support Extra Mile Day on November 1st, 2020. Now, therefore, I, Brandon Bochinski, Mayor of Grand Forks, North Dakota, do hereby proclaim November 1st, 2020 to be Extra Mile Day. I urge each individual in our community to take the time on this day to not only go the extra mile in his or her, her own life, but to also acknowledge all those around who are inspirational in their efforts and commitment to make their organizations, families, community, country, or world a better place. Extra mile day, November 1st. All right, moving on to three, public hearings and second readings of ordinances. 3.1 is public hearing and second reading of ordinance to amend the zoning map to rezone portion of lot one, block one, Calgary subdivision from B3 general business district to R4, multiple family residence, high density district, located at 3800 13th Avenue North. Thank you. We got Mr. Brooks. Was there any public comment on this one? No, there was not from me. All right. Open the hearing. Hearing is closed. Anybody need an update or do we want to questions, comments, or motion? Move approval. A motion from Mr. Veen, second from Mr. Weber. All those in favor, favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. That motion carries 3.2. Public hearing and second re reading of ordinance to amend the zoning map to rezone lot 17 to 21, block 67, Highway Redaway right Alexander and the Ives addition from B3 General Business District to R3 Multiple Family Residence Medium dis Density District located at 1310 to 1314 8th Avenue North. Well, with that, again, I'll open up uh, public hearing if we don't have a presentation. So, anybody here for that one? Close the public hearing. Any questions, comments, motions? Move. We got uh, Vice President Mock moves for approval, second from Mr. Veen. All those in fav favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those same sign. That motion carries 3.3. Public hearing and second reading of ordinance to dedicate right away and preliminary approval of the Plata Queries 11th edition located 5900 to 6000 block of Cherry Street. All right, same story here. Do we have, uh, we'll open this up to public hearing. Public hearing is closed. Uh, do we have any? Comments or questions on this second reading? We've got a move to approval by Mr. Weber. Second for Mr. Veen. Any other questions, comments? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. We're losing enthusiasm there. 3.4. <laughs> Public hearing and second reading of ordinance to annex Curry's 11th edition and adjacent areas not previously annexed. All right. We will open the public hearing again. All right, public hearing is closed. Any? Move we'll approval. All right, Mr. Sandy moves to approve. We have a second. Um, uh, Mr. Veen. Well, no, I have a question. I have a question as well. Okay, let's give me a second. I got a second from Mosh, and now we'll open up to more comments. Why don't we start with you, Mr. Veen, please? Yeah, Mr. Brooks, could you? I, I'm trying to remember what we had last time and what's been changed since that this came through, whatever, two weeks ago. Mayor, could you hit that second light down? Oh, let me see. 
see why this is not working here. Well, I guess I'll I'll go to uh, to my on um, the map that we had uh, produced for you guys. Uh, we went to the 140 foot on each side of Cherry Street. So the um, I think the original um, item that we had had for you, uh, we were 140 foot on each side of Cherry, and then 140 foot on each side of uh, 60th Avenue South. So we are grabbing that southern piece on, on 60th Avenue South as well. You said we on 60th Avenue South, mm -hmm. that dash line is the future 60th Avenue South, is that right? That, uh, correct, that's going to be, that's part of that annexation as well on attachment one. But previously we were not taking the South 140 foot off of uh, 60th Avenue South. But that's, okay, I got it. I was probably looking at the, wrong, looking at the, the one on top where it didn't have that. Yeah, I think the original staff reports gets attached as well. So uh, when we amend it, that, that's on that, uh, I think it's a secondary one, I believe, on, on the attachments so, on the new, new staff report. So that's great. I think that's that's an improvement. The, the, old, the other issue would be going west of Cottonwood and east of Cherry Street. We still have a very open space there, right? That's not a part of this. We That's right. We didn't, we didn't take those at this time until the, the development comes in the future. So that was, uh, as I understood, the, the intent of that motion at that time was not to take those. I believe the north of 61st, is that owned by the school district as well? That's correct, yep. That was part of that discussion that, uh, exactly as you said, Mayor, the north of uh, 61st is owned by the school district. And south of 61st is owned by? That's going to be owned by Crary uh, at this time. I, I'm sure it's under a, a another name, but uh, essentially it's the Crary family. So the future of that south will be single family or something in the future? Uh, right now, actually, it's multifamily in our land use plan. It can go anywhere from single family to multifamily under that zoning, but they are allowed up to multifamily along 62nd. Okay, I'll just just make one last comment. I think this is an improvement. I, I think it's great. I, I had thought we were going to do less. We create a little bit more spot annexations by not including the whole area at this time. I wish we would have had that area in, in between still uh, as a part of the annexation, but that's just where I'm at with this one. I understand. In, uh, in the future, as we, and I think I mentioned it too in the staff report, as we uh, jump 62nd, which is coming, um, we are looking to go to a larger block too. So we've, we've kind of made that announcement as well so that as we jump that piece uh, it, um, and we put in a lift station, we have kind of put people on notice that that will be a larger piece that we'll be bringing in. Yeah, and I think that's good. Philosophically, we've said we were going to start trying to not have all of these little spots, but just to annex as a general policy. And it just feels like when this one here came up, we just reverted back to the way we've always done it. I understand. That's it. Mr. Weber. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, speaking of philosophically, uh, Mr. Brooks, you just mentioned uh, jumping 62nd. Mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, some rhetoric, some discussion we've had over the last several years that seems to have faded away. Ms. Uh, Vice President Mock has, has brought it up at different times. Um, we uh, tend to treat all growth and expansion as, as positive, but uh, growth and expansion comes at different costs. Uh, and as we continue to push further south, while there's things I like about this development in terms of its design, it is um, uh, expensive to, to move further and further south. Do we, I, I apologize because I think I know the answer, but I'll, I'll ask the question. Uh, do we have a clear understanding of the city's financial revenues and obligations resulting from this development? What is it going to cost us? What can we anticipate in terms of property tax revenue over the next 25 years? Do we have that kind of information? We, we have not 
calculated that at this t uh, point in time. Uh, that is something that we've looked at. We've talked about uh, looking at that even through our land use plan, potentially even uh, utilizing Smart Growth America, who, who does capture those things. Uh, at this time, we have not moved forward with that. We were uh, close to doing that, uh, say, in March, uh, mid-March of uh, this year. So uh, that is something that we can put back uh, forward and, and start to look at calculating those costs. I, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. We're often told uh, with city government we need to run more like a business. I, I don't always agree with that. Um, uh, government is distinct from the private sector, from business. Uh, we have... Uh, we don't have a profit motive, for instance. We have a service motive. But uh, in, in cases like this, we do want to make sure that it pencils out. And I believe that what we'll find is that th this kind of uh, expansion is quite expensive for the city. Um, the entire area you just mentioned, it, it is possible for multifamily, but it, it's all R1. Is that correct? No, it could go anywhere from... Uh single family all the way up to multifamily but uh, uh, in it's all own. residential we, we that's correct so um, in this area yep. the kind of mixed use uh that that uh, we've been uh, trying to promote in other places um so that you can have uh, neighborhood shopping uh, coffee shops whatever it might be uh that would not currently be possible with this this development is that correct also? not along not in this area that we're looking at it, it is further along washington in this area that would be their neighborhood commercial area okay fair enough and then uh, Mr. Mayor, you mentioned uh, that the school district uh, owns some property right adjacent to this. Uh, and one other thing that I'm concerned about, we're talking about closing down schools in existing neighborhoods, uh, families fighting to keep those schools open, and I'm worried about uh, uh, opening up uh, one more school further south while we're, uh, we have a school district with um, currently funded by the core of the community we're losing schools in that core community and uh, po potentially building new schools uh, further out. Uh, that's all I've got, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Yeah. Mayor, can I make one last comment? Yeah, please. Mr. Brooks, mm -hmm. in the future, should that area that we've just talked about be annexed? Is it, does it have to go? Is there a annexation formula or policy? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, to me, it's easier to annex it now as a part of a bigger annexation then come back and try to annex a little piece where you have no uh i don't know if the word is power or authority to come in and do that you'd have to go through a much extensive annexation process to come and get that at a later time well yeah if they try to annex if they want to develop the piece they're going to have to come back before and make a request for annexation so they wouldn't be able to develop it as it currently sits. Those 140 foot strips, I suppose we could put single family along there, but really that's just the city's protection in case but uh, it gets turned if the back. the area south of 61st was to want to be annexed, mm -hmm. you would create a whole island in there because the school would not necessarily request annexation and we could not force annexation at a later time. From the school? Yeah. yeah um, I anticipate that the school would not be built in that location, but that's obviously a school district uh, discussion. But they had owned property to the north of this, and then um, they uh, transferred, traded with the developer to put it in this location. I anticipate it's very possible that that would move further south to a new location, because I'm not sure that the school district's ready to build at this point and not in this location necessarily. Ms. Mock. Uh, where, could you clarify for me, where was, there was a park district land or stormwater reserve and then also school district land? Was so the uh, uh, park district owns north of the, the school property. So, so they own north of 60. Yeah, it's, so in, it's in, within city south. limits now. Oh, it, so the park district is within city limits. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Yep. And we do have that pond in that, in in that, that location. In that section. Okay. Yep. And so then it's the school district area that wouldn't be annexed in with this Yep, portion. that's a portion that's out. Did we approach them and ask them? We haven't happened? talked to them as of yet, but uh, we did anticipate their uh, answer would be that, uh, no, we aren't willing, or we're not wanting to pay more special assessments. Obviously, taxes aren't, aren't something that, uh, that they pay, but they would be uh, 
they would have the special assessments and and Emily did get those to me I, I don't have those right in front of me right now but uh, I believed for that whole parcel would be uh, was over a hundred thousand I believe All right, any other questions comments we do have a motion and a second on the floor so seeing none all those in favor signify by saying aye aye Opposed, same sign. Aye. Aye. All right, why don't we run that down roll call so we can have a, it's a little harder with on here. Mr. Weigel, yes or no? Yes. Ms. Dockler? No. Mr. Weber? No. Ms. Mock? Yes. Mr. Kwame? I apologize. I, I feel like I came in mid discussion, so I'm not comfortable um, voting. Just out of staying at this point. Came on. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Mr. Sandy? I don't know that we can abstain. Is that something we can do? Uh, Mr. Gostad? Uh, abstention is counted. To, if you abstain, it's counted in the majority, but you shouldn't abstain. You should vote. M Mr. Mayor, I, I vote yes. Okay. Mr. Sandy has a yes, and Mr. Veen? Uh, no. So I believe we have two yeses and four noes. Is that correct? Is that how you read it? Is the intention to not allow this to be annexed um, because a larger parcel would want to be annexed in the future, or what are we? Um... Did it pass four to three? No, nope, I believe. What was the count there? I, I have three three. I have Weigel voting yes. Okay. Mock voting yes. Sandy voting yes. Dockler voting no. Weber voting no. Veen voting no. And Kavami abstaining. So we have a 3 3. So where do we go with that, Mr. Gosted? With uh, Mr. Kwame, maybe he needs to be brought up to speed here. I'm not sure what the procedural route would be for that. I, I would encourage Mr. Kavami to uh, enter a vote. Well, prior, prior to the discussion, I was going to vote yes. So unless there has been something that has drastically changed anybody's opinion, my vote would have been yes had I been forced to vote prior to the meeting. So I will just vote yes then. Okay, so Mr. Um, Kwame, yes or no? Yes? yes. All right. So that carries 4-3, I believe. Yep. All right. 3.5. All right, 3.5. Public hearing on appeals, certification of special assessments, and approved findings on various projects as listed in detail on your agenda. Um, this serves as um, being read into the record. We'll handle these all together unless there's anyone here to speak to a specific project. All right, we'll uh, open the public hearing with that. And it, yeah, it's A through QQ um, as, uh, as put in the record. Any public comments that were received online on this? Either one person, nothing. All right, with that, we're going to close the public hearing on that. Questions, comments, concerns, motions by council? Who? Got a motion to approve by uh, Council Member Veen. Got a second by Mr. Weber. All those in favor signify, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. That motion carries unanimously. 3.6, public hearing and second reading of ordinance amending Grand Forks City Code section 6-010114 relating to list of department heads. All right, thank you. I, would, I guess I'll speak just briefly and then open that up to public hearing. Um, this was a 4-3 vote um, to approve this. Uh, we, it was a recommendation of a, HR, city administration, engineer, city planner, um, and myself to, to vote in the, in the um, dissent on this, to vote no. Um, I just I think it's really important this is a new position it's important that we get it right we need to have a little bit of freedom uh, as we set up this contract and can certainly look at uh, moving it to a, um, a contract or a civil service contractor position in the future but uh, for now I think we uh, need to go along with the what the precedent has been and what we've done in the past of when we create these new positions so the, let them go a couple of years and then look at changing uh, the code and adding them that way I know there's some other cleanup that we need to do in the code but for now we're just just looking at this one position um, so with that, I'm going to open it up to public hearing and then any comment. Seeing no public hearing, we'll close the public hearing and then uh, any comment from the from uh, council? Mr. Veen, did you have something? No, I, I, maybe I misunderstood. 
I said, I thought I understood what the motion was. Could you repeat it again? Yep, so this, this motion is to um, create a, an ordinance. This is the second reading of the, of the ordinance um, to move or to, to re rewrite the code, I believe, which is attached here, um, to include inspections as a um, classified department head. Is that is that correct, Mr. Gosthead? Uh, that's correct. Yep. Does that clarify? All right. Any other questions or comments? I'm sorry, one more time. So this is to write into the code that this is a classified position or a contract position? Nope. So last time we created um, the inspections department head position. And then um, by default, that'd be a contracted position, um, as we have done in the past. And then we received a second motion during that that had asked uh, um, Mr. Gossett to create an ordinance that would create this as a classified position, um, which currently planning and um, engineering or not, um, and we, we was voted four to three. Okay, does that clarify for everybody? <laughs> and, and support of uh, the, the current? Uh, four to three was in support, yep, that's yep. correct. And that's what we're affirming or uh, going against tonight. Yep, very good. good. I'll, I'll move approval. So we have a motion to approve, we have a second. Uh, Mr. Veen seconds. So I'm gonna go uh, roll call again on this. Um, we'll look for a yes or no. Mr. I like to, can I just say one thing? Yeah, please. I think it's important. We've got two other positions that are similar that that are not classified positions. Often, not very often, we go against what our city staff have said, and in this situation, we're going against that with our with what our human resources director has said, what our city administrator has said, um, with what our our mayor has said, asking for it within this position to to try something new. I think with a contracted position, it being a new position, we put ourselves in an opportunity to, to, to see if we truly need this position. It's a trial phase. And I think if we automatically throw it into a classified position, I'm not so sure it works out so well. So I'm not in favor of it having, uh, being the, the classified position, I'm in favor of a contract position. I think we have to side with our, with our city staff in this decision. Thank you, Mr. Weigel. Uh, Mr. Mayor? Yeah, Mr. Sandy, please. Sorry to interrupt, thank you. Um, I think it, this actually does beg the question if we shouldn't have a broader discussion at some point about the continued validity of the entire civil service process within our city. With the um, salary plan the way we have it, where we pay market rates, having the additional protections of civil service, I'm not sure are still valid uh with the way that the city currently does our salary planning um i i i am going to uh um, not pass judgment yet at least i believe we should we should have that conversation at some point not necessarily tonight i do however agree with mr weigel i believe we should uh um go along with the recommendations of our city staff because uh on issues related to staffing historically we've gone along with the recommendations of our hr department and i don't see any reason why we wouldn't continue that tonight thank you mayor thank you mr sandy i think yeah as we look at possible code changes for some of the other classified uh, positions that need to be cleaned up we could have that broader discussion too on civil service so i think that's a great idea all right with that do we have any other comments all right, now we're going to go to a roll call roll call vote again. Uh, Mr. Weigel, yes or no? No. Ms. Dockler? Yes. Mr. Weber? Yes. Ms. Mock? Yes. Mr. Kwame? No. Mr. Sandy? No. Mr. Veen? Yes. All right, 4-3. Motion carries. I think that is it for public hearings. Now we can move on to our number four action items. Let's, uh, I know we're gonna pull 4.1, 4.2, 4.3, um, and then 4.16 is gonna introduce an ordinance. So was there any, um, any uh, Mr. Veen or others that wanted to pull uh, 413, 414, or 415, or any others? Otherwise, are you good? 
All right, so we're going we're gonna to consent agenda move forward um, with 4.4, 4.5, 4.6, 4.7, 4.8, 4.9, 4.10, 4.11, 4.12, 4.13, 4.14, 4.14, 4.14, 4.14, and 4.15. We'll have a motion. Motion to approve by Mr. Uh, Weber. We have a second by Ms. Mock. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Those motions carry. We're going to go, let's go to 4.1. We'll swing back around to do uh, 4.16. So 4.1. Uh, the Red River Biorefinery. Mayor Botanski and members of City Council has been allowed to get to these action items. Um, thankfully, you don't have to do anything tonight. So um, I, I wasn't sure if uh, Red River Biorefinery would need a uh, 11th hour assistance, but uh, we're going to work through the mayor and his uh, emergency authorities. And uh, we were just FYI, this will be an FYI update for you. Um, they were um, proceeding along quite well with their pretreatment system. As you recall, they were under emergency, a previous order. Um, hopefully be up and going really well by in and around the first part of October. Things were going well. They were at 90% of 100%. Uh, things have gone backwards. And so um, just FYI, so you're not surprised, we're working through um, kind of a new restart with Red River Biorefinery with under the mayor's authority related to the COVID pandemic. Um, so just FYI, we don't need any support now, but um, we're working through this week. And uh, if it goes past the 60 days that the mayor has, we may be back here in December again uh, with further further requests from you. For right now, it's just an update. Things are going along well. They've gone backwards, two steps back. We were going one step forward. and so. That's just kind of where we're at with regular buyer finder. So, so is there no action? No action. Taken on that? On just that? an update okay. on that. Okay. All right. Can Can you share a little bit more? So things are going well. We're going backwards. Yeah. Those are opposite statements. They are. They They were going very well, and you know, in a, yeah. in a wastewater treatment plant system, uh, things can go well, and then something can go wrong because it's biology. You know, it's it's and things. Uh, it's not like treating water. Well, you know, let's put more chemicals or let's do this. If uh, something happens in the system, it becomes upset. Um, it can go downhill pretty quick, and I think that's what happened. And we're, we're sorting through what happened. Was it operational issues? Uh, was it uh, design issues? Um, um, they are requesting that it is all related, to, again, to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. So. Uh, that's how it goes. So we're sorting through the facts and, and are going to ask for consideration um, and review by our mayor as part of his authority. Any other questions for Mr. Fielder this time? Otherwise, it's, you know, I guess we can take it as it comes in, in the future here. Well, if the mayor does act this week or, you know, subsequently um, after this week, you will be informed about you know, what actions we may or may not have take this week okay. yeah certainly won't take any actions that put our wastewater treatment plant at any risk and, and do the best we can under the circumstances so okay anything else for mr Phelan? thanks All mr right. mayor thanks mr Phelan. with that it will move on to uh some development here 4.2 the beacon by epic redevelopment tax <clears throat> incentive pre-application Thank you, Mayor Bochensky. Now, this is a fun one. This is uh, an exciting thing. As you recall, over the last, I want to just highlight a, a couple projects leading up to these two that we're going to talk about tonight that we're already involved in. So uh, a couple weeks ago, you did approve moving forward with the St. John's uh, block building and annex uh, that Mike Koontz was the signature on that. So um, we are engaged um, with our third party financial advisor. Uh, Baker Chili on that one. Previously, and this has been several months ago, um, the Lions development, mixed use development, which is right across the street um, from City Hall. We are going to um, further look at that project that's already been approved by a pre application, uh, those two particular projects. Um, and so those are two in the queue. These are two additional projects. Um, and I think we'll start with the first one. And we, we have um, with us this evening, we have Todd Burning, Lance Johnson, and Matt Marshall. And uh, if you were here in the 90s and the 2000s, you would have known Todd Burning as he was, I think, the first executive director for the Ralph Engelstad Arena. Lance Johnson used to work for the uh, Alaris Center as a marketing person and has done various other things. So they're part of a development group based out of Fargo. So they're going to be here along with Matt to kind of give you a, a PowerPoint presentation of this and lots of nice visuals. And so moving forward, and then maybe once they're done with the presentation, and we're not going to get in, down into all the, all the bloody details because 
as you recall, what we're asking for tonight is for you to approve the pre-application that this is, these are serious projects so that we can move forward with a more or further due diligence on the financial incentive side. And um, all of these mixed use projects, whether they're on the UND campus or the, the ones downtown, are all, they're all mixed use, they're all gonna need incentives, they're all a little nuanced from one another. Um, but it's, it's similar in many ways. But um, I think the one you're gonna see here, talk with Todd and his team, is a game changer. And it really fits well with our downtown development plan that we looked at. When you look at the town square, how do we drive more activities, more concerts, those kinds of things. I think this has an opportunity to be what we really wanted, we were pondering doing at the town square, this is probably a better venue for that. Obviously, it's going to need some public assistance to get that, just like expanding a town square or, or that as we move forward. So, uh, again, I want to highlight on this one, too. Um, similar to the St. John's building, not to surprise anyone, but we just generally ask the developers to come forward and ask for everything that you need, knowing that there's going to be a third-party review and we're going to do, be doing our due diligence and come back to the, both the local government advisory committee and the city council and the school district and the county. So that process will go forward. Let's keep an open mind. Let's try to uh, move these uh, forward. But this project, they are going to ask for a TIF bond on this one, um, similar to with the St. John's building. So um, our advisor from Baker Chili, Michaela, will take a look at both the incentive piece, the, the TIF bond piece, and some other incentives that we can go along. Um, one other thing, the town, this town's um, house development is in the opportunity zone too, so that will be evaluated also as part of this development too. So there's always the layering of all these incentives. So with that, I'd ask Todd and his team and who, however they're gonna present here, and then at the end when, when they're done, I'll, I'll come up and uh, discuss any conclusions. Well, Mr. Burning, Mr. Johnson, Mr. Marshall, I, I think, uh, you know, thank you for being brave enough to bring forward a $50 million project amidst uh, this pandemic and, uh, you know, a game changer. So we're excited to see the uh, presentation. Okay. Who's, ru who's running that? Who's, who's running the screen? Okay. okay. Just go right there. All right. Thanks, Mr. Mayor, Commission. Uh, appreciate the time and, and yeah it is exciting uh, uh, what we're gonna go over tonight is just give a broad view of, of what we'd like to do um, as part of our pre TIF application I guess you could call it and um, some of you have, have seen the venue that you're gonna see some pictures of uh, this is the lights in West Fargo uh, which was built by epic um, if we go to the next screen here oh there we go um, who is Epic? Uh, it's it's more than myself, and I don't know where that went. There it went. Okay. Um, we do mixed use buildings. That's that's what we do. And our definition of mixed use is really um, a little different. Uh, we actually look at the mix of, of the commercial tenants and how that affects parking and flow. Uh, we look at the mix of apartments, not only within the facility itself, but within the area. In this case, would be downtown. Um, and we also look at condos, and, and condos are a, a little different than uh, customized condos. These are more mass market condos, and right now we're in the middle of a study of the Grand Forks area. Uh, we just completed one in the Fargo metro area, and it came in very, very strong, and we expect the same thing to happen in Grand Forks. Um, so we'll work through that and, and update you as we go through it. Um, so we have 20-plus uh, mixed-use facilities of in that 10 to 15 million dollar range and some bigger than that uh, lots of commercial space and uh, after this year we'll be over a thousand units so we're relatively young to the development uh, game but at the same time uh, we have our niche and uh, and the mayor and others came and took a tour of of the lights and just uh, uh, got a feel for what it is and and every place we we do um, our TIF is a little bit different, and we'll explain that tonight. And, um, our, our, our TIF value that we can create uh, goes into things that the public can see, touch, and use. Um, it, it doesn't go into sewers and things like that. Um, so it, it'll be a little bit different, and I'm sure uh, hopefully if we get the approval to move forward with the, the city staff, uh, we can even explain to that in, in some more detail. So we'll go through it. Lance is going to do part of it. Uh, Matt Marshall, uh, he is uh, 
uh, used to be the economic development director for the city of West Fargo, and he was the crazy one that asked me to do uh, the lights and, and redo downtown West Fargo, and I said yes, and uh, he stuck with us until we got uh, to the finish line, and, and now uh, he works here and lives here in Grand Forks uh, for Minn Kota Power, uh, but he knows the details of how it linked up to Bank of North Dakota, how it worked with the bonding, um, et cetera, and uh, it's a little different model than you've seen in other places. No question about that. You're up. <clears throat> okay, so uh, I'd like to talk about the idea. Um, the idea that we have is making a great place in downtown Grand Forks even better. Um, we will program it and activate this new space in uh, new exciting ways, bring entertainment and activity to the downtown area. Um, we'd re repurpose the blighted property where the townhouse currently is. We provide alternate living options, uh, condos, apartments, again, based on how the study comes back. Uh, we'd have commercial space for lease and the mixed use model. Uh, we'll enha enhance the parking in this area. Better utilization of the current ramps. Uh, there's a lot of, or actually there's two ramps in close proximity of this property. Uh, and when we have events and driving people traffic downtown, it would use those ramps uh, to their ability. Uh, we brought in the scope and size of downtown. Um, downtown Grand Forks isn't that big. We figured that this would extend it, that footprint even more. Uh, and I think the best part is we're not bringing a new idea to town. This has been tested. As Todd mentioned, the lights in West Fargo has been a great success, even with the challenges of COVID this year. And uh, we think this would be a great model to bring to the Grand Forks area as well. Am I ready? Okay, uh, the details, and I might go out of order here a little bit, uh, but the project cost is going to be at a minimum of $50 million. Um, right now. We're probably scheduled to do a little over 60, uh, just based on square footage and things like that. Um, closing date, we, we will acquire um, the current townhouse site uh, from uh, Dakota Commercial and, and Craig Tweeden uh, within 90 days. Uh, if we're given the green light and obviously we'll demolish the blighted property um, and, and make a vacant lot uh, we'd like to start construction uh, this spring early summer just depending on how timeline goes with the city and ourselves just working together uh, there's a, there'll be a lot to it through the development agreement no question about that um, I'll skip number five uh, Matt will talk a little bit about that uh, the public amenity um, is, is going to be in that eight nine million dollar range, just depending on some variables. And you know what what we're asking to do is is work together with the city and, and other pieces of the city. It could be the convention visitors bureau, etc., on input of, of what helps drive commerce, um, not only for downtown but for the community as a whole. So where that dollar amount ends up will be obviously within our capacity and within a, a, a priority of amenities uh, for this facility. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, as Todd mentioned, my name is Matt Marshall. I am the former economic developer for the city of West Fargo. I am currently the economic developer for Minn Kota Power and a new resident here in Grand Forks. Uh, so I'm here as a part of my official capacity um, I've been given permission to help out with this pro or help the city um, any way uh, necessary and then also as a concerned citizen frankly um, what Todd described is exactly right this these types of projects um, when we embarked in the first adventure is unique uh, oftentimes you'll see TIF districts that are used for um, infrastructure that might support an industrial building or sometimes housing depending on the community that you're working within um, this money and the TIF allocation really goes for a public amenity to serve the public um, it was unique to North Dakota when we did it um, and now um, we have a model for it and so um, what we leveraged in West Fargo um, there was a little bit of trial and error, error. Uh, not error, but just uh, lots of different ideas thrown in there about how to create project my milestones and how to leverage the Bank of North Dakota. It was new for them at the time as well. Um, and so we really built an interesting model there um, 
those of us who are in on the public finance side and then the developer. Um, and so we ended up doing a, a, a public TIF, um, leveraging those dollars to support the public infrastructure for a public purpose. Um, and wanted to offer my help um, to work with city staff or council to fill gaps, um, help develop the plan, explain what we did in West Fargo that made it work, um, and provide any perspective that you need. Yeah, I, I think that's really important. And, uh, you know, the same team would be put together uh, to work on this with the city, um, including John Shockley from Onsted Twitchell, who understands the legal side of this really, really well and, and could work with your legal team and, and uh, help figure that out. Um, the primary partners, um, as we see it, uh, obviously ourselves will be taking the lead in this. Um, and, and working through the development agreement, um, along with uh, Dakota Commercial, Kevin Ritterman, uh, who I've known for a long time, and obviously he's he's a big component of, of what's happening around here in the development side. Um, we have our own in-house architect um, just to direct traffic of other architects and engineers, and um, uh, Icon Architects, uh, will be the building architect and uh, but we quarterback that it, it's a little bit different system but it works out really well and icon and is used to uh, this system and was a, a big part of the lights so we're again keeping the same team together just to he says trial and error i don't know about the error we're just going to refine some things so it's all good and then uh, obviously community contractors will be the construction manager of the project um, just give some examples. This is where we're downtown um, West Fargo, and, and probably a lot of people say didn't know West Fargo had a downtown, and uh, we're really working through recreating that. And we'll have uh, I don't know that 60, 70 million dollars of new buildings down there. We're in building number three right now, um, but we we specialize a lot in underground parking connectivity. Um, both underground and above ground. Uh, just gives you an example. That was our first one downtown. Um, I don't know if I'm going farther than I'm supposed to, but I will. Um, the, the programming is much more than concerts. And uh, we, we have really proven that this year of the small events to the big events. And uh, it was a little different during COVID. A um, lot of community programming. We make the, the space will end up being owned by the community. Is, is whether it's a 501 or it's the city of Grand Forks, uh, we'll work through that. And so, you know, there's, there's spaces, it's a space for the community programming, family fun nights and, and movie nights, uh, acoustic nights, fitness classes during the day uh, really took off. Uh, during the whole COVID thing, outdoor went really well. Uh, food truck events, speaker series, uh, we had the head coach of of, I hate to say it here, the University of Minnesota football team. <laughs> uh, go Sioux, right? <laughs> but anyway, um, the speaker series, car shows, concerts, etc. It's very, very versatile, and it can be used for a lot of different things. And, and when you mention the word concerts, it's not, you know, a, a 20,000. It, it's a much smaller, you know, three to 4,000 uh, that the capacity could hold. So it, it gives you an idea of, of, and the pictures do it. And the top right is actually a, a small, uh, the small plaza, which is much more uh, the size of what you currently have uh, down on Demers by the river. Um, that's our downtown West Fargo one. And then we have the big one on the lights. Um, I think that is when the coach spoke there. But uh, it, it, we're used to working hand in hand with a smaller venue as well and obviously with bigger venues and we just kind of fit right in the middle there and become an asset and a, another option for the community. Um, one of my capacities at EPIC is I um, run EPIC events. EPIC events is a um, a privately owned by our development company uh, promoter. So we, we do some uh, at-risk events at the lights, such as um, the speaker Todd was talking about. We also had some smaller concerts there this year. Uh, one opportunity we do look at uh, with this um, possible Grand Forks 
project is the ability to route some of these smaller shows that we do like the Sawyer Brown something that somebody from Grand Forks may not travel to West Fargo to see uh, and vice versa so sometimes we could get uh, uh, more bang for our buck to bring an artist uh, to shows in, in these nearby communities. Um, we also have a focus on the arts. Um, we're working on several uh, art projects within the community. One thing about Epic as a developer is every one of our buildings we have local art involved on some level. If that's paintings in the lobby um, or a project we're working on right now is uh, the first uh, uh, Epic art show and we have over a hundred um, pieces of work from regional artists uh, that will be uh, work with them to give them a, uh, a date to and an event to sell their art and showcase it in the community. Oh, there we go. That'd be better. Okay. Uh, connectivity, real quick, I'll talk to you about the lights. Um, each of our buildings are connected uh, through skyways, uh, underground. Uh, it's, you know, we have parking underneath for uh, the majority of our buildings. Um, we really have that work, play, live area at the lights, and that's what we see bringing uh, to downtown Grand Forks. Um, and, and again, uh, you do have an outdoor space downtown, and we believe this would just be another uh, addition to the downtown area to use in that capacity. Yeah. Um, uh, revenue generation. So, so even though we're staying at the 30,000 foot level today, you know, one question always comes up is, okay, that's great, you're gonna create the space, but how do we pay for it? Um, these are just some ideas and some of the concepts that have worked well in, in West Fargo. Uh, in West Fargo, we created a management group called West Fargo Events. It's a nonprofit and it's made up of local stakeholders. So there's members of the um, West Fargo Public School District, the City Council, the Park District, and a couple of at-large members. Um, it's a 501c3. Uh, they are hired to operate and manage the uh, facility on behalf of the city. Now, this is a, an outdoor kind of blank space um, venue. So the overhead isn't as high as, as other you know, larger venues. Um, but we do use a few different uh, uh, revenue generators to uh, assist and to subsidize the community programming uh, that West Fargo event does. Um, we do have a large video marquee on the corner of our entertainment district. Uh, we have camp fees, which are um, common, area, what is it? Common, area. common area maintenance fees. Um, so every square footage of commercial space pays a small fee that goes towards that programming of community events in that space. Um, uh, West Fargo Events has uh, beca uh, become uh, the nonprofit at the gaming location on site, which is uh, uh, generated some revenue uh, to go towards the project and then also naming rights and sponsorship and things like that all those go into the bucket to help support that community programming uh, we think of the visibility in downtown Grand Forks you come over that overpass and and see this uh, this great community space uh, I'd say the one thing about epic is our buildings are, uh, are are really nice to look at we get a lot of compliments there um, We'd like to work on using this project to uh, boost recognition for the community. Again, making this great downtown even better. And uh, the signage with the video board would be a great uh, entry uh, from the overpass into downtown. Evaluation. Also with this project, we believe um, not only do we own some uh, smaller properties downtown, but we believe uh, the more activity that comes down, the higher the valuation will become and the increase in the value of all other buildings in the downtown area. Uh, here's our general layout again, very similar to the lights. Uh, and we just wanted to start kind of with this uh, generic canvas because a lot of things can change. But as of right now, we'd be looking at about three buildings. There'd be underground and surface parking. Uh, the plaza would be very similar to that of the lights. The lights plaza is 40,000 square feet. We see that um, space fitting well uh, on this piece of property. Um, the expansion of space could flow on to First Avenue North. If, if the project is set up this way, uh, we do have First Avenue North and then working with city departments. Uh, if an event would outgrow that space, we feel like there's some public space that we could maybe bleed into. Um, and again, uh, we're designing it for the least amount of sound impact. Granted, you have a, a loud movie night or a speaker or a concert, um, you do have neighbors and we take those uh, issues very serious and uh, we, we work on designing around uh, keeping that good for the neighbors.
Thanks, Lance. So I'll wrap it up. Uh, experience, uh, we do a lot of work in North Dakota. Uh, we worked with a lot of communities. Uh, we have started in Grand Forks with a couple of smaller projects. Um, but every one of these communities, it, it, it's, it, it's an effort of some have one or two layers of economic development funds and, and community amenities, and, and some even go deeper than that. And uh, so we're proud of that. It's a lot of times we're taking the hard way to get there, but uh, it's, it's, a better, it's a better feeling for our investors. Uh, we tell our investors, you know, don't expect home runs, expect singles and doubles. And, uh, and you'll make a difference to the quality of life. And, and I think uh, you know, where we've been speaks for itself. Um, the last slide I have is references. And uh, I think that's important. I mean, and when we have Tina at the top, uh, I invite you to talk to her and, and the mayor and, and everybody else at West Fargo. And, and we're working a lot with Fargo now and, and Minot. We've, we've done some good projects with their flood recovery funds. Um, and then the banking side, um, and probably the one that didn't make this slide was uh, Bank of North Dakota. Uh, when they heard about what we're doing with Fargo at Eola, um, it's about a $150 million project. And then this one potentially, uh, they called us and wanted to know, what are you up to? What do we need to allocate? What do we need to have on reserve? Um, are these projects gonna be similar to the lights? Because that worked out really well. And uh, that's a reference uh, as well. And uh, obviously, you have a, a local representative here, but we also work directly with uh, the folks in Bismarck just because of the size of what we use um, to make it work. Uh, so I, I think that's important. And uh, that wraps it up, Mr. Mayor. I don't know if there's any other questions by anybody. Well, we'll open up this questions. Uh, Mr. Oh, Veen, please. Oh. So uh, it's a, it's really an exciting project um, it's it's anxious i know there's been discussions about this for for a few years i think it's great i've been in the onset twitchell and offices uh, oh. for that building is very mm -hmm. nice it's really changed downtown i think west fargo a lot mm -hmm. for what that's really brought to to the space and uh, um, so i i think it's a great concept and look forward to seeing how I, I, i'm also uh, feel very good about your timeline. I think that's a great timeline to keep things sure. moving downtown and kind of with Hugo's downtown and the reconstruction of Demers Avenue and all of the street improvements we had. I think this is going to enhance that area from what it is today. So I look forward to seeing how we can make this work. Sure. Thank you. And, and Hugo's is, uh, if I could comment, uh, it, that, that's a home run. Uh, I, the fruits of that is going to be crazy. You know, Fargo has been trying to get a grocery store downtown forever, and uh, it's not it's not easy to do. And luckily, you have an owner that understands big picture of the community. No question. Questions, Mr. Weber? Yes, please. Um, a fantastically exciting project. Thank w you. Wonderful. Um, uh, th this is a bit odd, but I'm going to go back to my earlier comments about uh, item 3.4, Quarry's 11th edition. Um, I'm actually glad that I lost the vote on that one because I don't want to see any development uh, canceled. But uh, my, my vote against it was because that type of development, you might have some short-term gain, but then long-term, those are expensive developments. This one, uh, the, the term was used, public assistance. I'd like to counter that because what you do is in the short term, you give up a percentage of nothing. And what you get long term is incredible value uh, and enhancement for not just for the downtown, for the entire community. This drives restaurant and hotel business across the community. It helps the uh, property tax base, which benefits us all. Uh, this is uh, fantastic. And uh, the, the kind of public assistance you have to do at the, uh, those kinds of residential developments, that's all utility stuff you can't see. This is stuff that you get to see and touch and use uh, right away. So uh, very excited about it. Uh, I uh, move approval, please. Yeah, yeah, and I, I appreciate that. And uh, you know, the other part of that is is you know, once you flip the switch on, how does it operate, and how does it make it through that? And we take a very hard look at that. And that's some of the aspects that Lance brought up of the different revenue generator items, but. The parking ramps, you know, approximately a mile away towards the area of commerce of downtown is huge. 
because if we can put people in those and and you know they go have dinner before or whatever after or even on a saturday afternoon it just drives commerce which increases value there's no question about that did you say they're a mile away? Well, half a mile, mile. I, we looked at the mile radius, and we reached out to the one over Maybe by Epic Place. Yeah, the one's just two blocks away. Yes, yeah. yeah, no, I get it. <laughs> but it, it's, it's. I mean, really, you've got three parking areas or whatever, you know, within a proximity of where people want to be. You know, they're not, you know, in the middle of a field somewhere. Right. It, it's just awesome. Yeah, it's a great setting. 4,000 parking spaces downtown. We use about 45% of them. They're yeah. going to help us fill those up. Yeah, we will. There's great. no question Wonderful. we will. It was uh, point 0.2 and point 0.3, the two parts. I don't know. There you go. I'm sorry, numbers in my head. Just I'm sorry. There. We, do, we do have a motion, like, a second, and then we can have further discussion if we want. Uh, we have a second. Mr. Veen seconds. Any other comments or questions? I think we're excited to see what Baker Tilly comes up with. So let's, uh, seeing none, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, aye. same sign. Oh, thank carries. you. Yep, thank you. Thanks, everybody. 4.3. Memorial Village Redevelopment Tax Incentive Pre-Application. Mr. Phelan, you're going to... I'm going to try to get this one off. Today, yes. Kick off, and then... Looks like Mr. Burian's in the... In the okay, another, another great... Now, this is, a, this is a true public, public, private development. So it's public with the, the, the local government, public with UND private with the private development in this case and and this is in the other downtown which is our other mixed-use dense area which would be the University of North Dakota this evening we have uh, Mike Peeper is in the back there and Mike is the uh, associate VP of facilities etc for UND and, and Mike uh, when you look at mayor you mentioned uh, I'm gonna have to give a shout out to Mike uh, you, th you talk about all the great things going on UND in the campus and its revival. Uh, Mike Peepers has, has a lot to do with that, and he, should, he deserves a big thank for all the energy and momentum he's brought to UND. And then uh, Steve Berrien is going to um, provide the... Steve Berrien was an old friend as an AU2S uh, owner, and now he's got his own firm with Berrien Associates. He's leading a team, and he's going to provide this presentation again, similar to the previous projects. We're just asking for approval to move forward. This will be nuanced versus a downtown project with UND and all the mixed use. Uh, we're asking that we just move forward with another great development, great opportunity, um, and this one on campus. So with that, Steve, if you wouldn't mind. Steve Burian, 3969 Ivy Drive. Um, thank you, Todd. My old friend, I think he meant longtime friend. I don't think he meant old. Um, Mayor Baczynski, members of the City Council, thank you much for the opportunity to be here. I am here representing Memorial Stadium LLC, which is a, a limited liability corporation that's put together in response to a P3 solicitation by the University of North Dakota for the um, redevelopment of the Memorial Stadium. The redevelopment is anticipated to be a five-story complex with underground parking. The first floor of the complex would be for... Um, the athletic offices of the University of North Dakota, and then the remaining four floors would be a mixed um, apartments from one bedroom apartments to two four bedroom apartments. I'm just giving you a sense for where we're at. If we were driving north on Columbia Road and giving, giving you the orientation, um, the right to your right or to the east would be the former Memorial Stadium. That will be replaced under this project with the building to the left on the figure here. Also in UND's long-term master plan is some work on their track and field and their turf um, in between the Memorial Stadium project, redevelopment, and the High Performance Center. And then also to the right, right tucked up against the existing High Performance Center is the High Performance Center expansion, which is contemplated. That would be a private fundraise project that the university would do to house the, the some various athletic sports within UND. Um, looking at Memorial Village LLC, that is comprised of, of representatives from Icon Architects, myself from Burian and Associates, and then Craig Tweeten from Community Contractors. And we are working with the University of North Dakota and hopefully with the City of Grand Forks to move this important project forward. Uh, this is just a sense for the overall site plan. So you can see if you're driving again north on Columbia Road, you can see where the, the Memorial Stadium redevelopment would be, and then as it relates to the High Performance Center. 
if we blow that up a little bit, and I can, I'll talk a little bit more about this project. What the intent of the project in in, is trying to do is to capture the historic character of Memorial Stadium, complement the architectural character of UND, enhance the Columbia Road entrance to, the, to UND, enhance undergraduate enrollment at UND, and support the academic, athletic, and business goals of the UND Athletic Department. So I described that, that left building as being a five-story complex. It will have 250 beds amongst those one to four bedroom apartments. And then as the city con or the university contemplates its next step, the High Performance Center, the university has recognized that that private fundraising that it's had to do across campus is getting to be more and more challenging. And so right now the university is, is rolling up its sleeves to decide how much of, of that high performance center will be located there and how much of it will be located in this new memorial stadium. So in other words, they know the athletic administration will be in, in Columbia in the memorial stadium redevelopment on the left. They know that the football locker rooms, the locker rooms for men's track and field and cross country, the weight room, um, student um, medical type services, student um, athletic training will all be in the high performance center, but they're trying to toggle on how much of the coaches offices, meeting rooms, film rooms, that type of thing could be moved from one place to the other. As they anticipate that, there's a chance that the Memorial Stadium project could take on more of the UND um, aspects of things, lowering the, the fundraise target for the high performance center and making it be able to be constructed um, more quickly as a result. Um, the high performance center itself has been a great success for Grand Forks with the new uh, athletic director. They've opened that up to public uh, involvement, so it's been used quite extensively by the community. And then as we've done some of this COVID testing and things, you're seeing that high performance center used more and more. Uh, this just shows a couple other aspects of things, and it's somewhat nuanced, but in the, over, in the master plan itself, there also is the t uh, this discussion of providing a walkway, a skywalk from the new Memorial Stadium redevelopment over to that parking structure on the north side. And then as part of the development of Memorial Stadium and the High Performance Center expansion, we're going to preserve that north wall of Memorial Stadium. It's kind of just that that blue rib or that green ribbon that's going across the top that would help to pr preserve the historical character of Memorial Stadium. We would anticipate about a 10 foot wide corridor with glass on the inside. So that would be heated corridor from the coaches offices if they're put in the Memorial Stadium over to the high performance center and back. And then with that glass, you'll be able to look out onto the complex and I have some renderings. You will see how nice that visibility is. And then it would also give the opportunity to put the history of UND lining the inside wall of that, much like you see in the current High Performance Center. If it may, I'd just like to go through a few of the renderings of this. You can see at one point we were looking at um, actually preserving one or two walls of the north end and the south end of Memorial Stadium with the 250 bed target right now. I don't think that'll be possible, but you can see the significant architectural finishes that are being contemplated for this project by Icon Architects to try to preserve the, the feel of the former Memorial Stadium. This is looking at the project from the Northwest, so at the intersection of um, UND and I think it's Second Avenue North. This would be viewing the project then from over by the High Performance Center looking to the west. So you can see the Hawkway, as we've affectionately named it, on the north side where we preserve that wall. You can see the, the back side of the contemplated Memorial Stadium, Memorial Village, LLC, and then the remainder of cam campus in the background to the west. Um, this would be viewed from the northeast now, so kind of seeing how that Hawkway um, segues into the, the east side of the new building. And in summary, I guess I'd just like to point out that this is a really um, important redevelopment for the failing Memorial Stadium Brownfield Real Development. Um, that building has well extended its life. It's almost 100 years old. Um, it is in disrepair at this point. It is not being, um, is not occupied and not being used for any activities. Um, it has, a, 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 being a former track athlete at UND, 
It has a lot of emotional connection for many of us, but it just has outlived its useful life. The goal of this, as Todd put it, maybe a P4 with UND and the city involved, is to support and advance the UND athletics through their athletic campus strategy. It'll be a strategic partnership with the city and the state and the University of North Dakota, along with the developer. It will provide significant complementary improvements to UND for their housing strategy for athletes and also um, the graduate level type housing option. I mentioned four, level, level, four bedroom apartments. Those are somewhat unorthodox in town, but there's, it's something that we've noted is needed in this community. And then it so happens that the three of us that are working on it are all alum, proud alumni of the University of North Dakota. Uh, the project is anticipated to cost $25 million plus. Um, that is, will, will not be finalized until we know exactly what portions of UND will fit into the project. Uh, much like the previous project is anticipated that demolition would take place in the spring and construction it would start right away in in the one if everything moves forward acceptably with that I'd be glad to answer any questions that anybody has questions or comments council members mr. mayor sorry to interrupt yep, mr. Sandy please I uh, I think I've been relatively clear in the past that I'm not a big supporter of the TIF bond concept. Um, I, I could have asked this to the EPIC folks. Um, and so because I'm asking Mr. Burian doesn't mean that I disagree with his concept or that I'm putting the onus on him on this. I just know that he knows the answers to the question. I'm hoping he can explain to the other council members and the public how the TIF bond works from the point of where the city approves the concept to uh, the time that uh, the developers get the funding and then ultimately when the city starts reaping the rewards of, of uh, property tax increase. Mr. Burian, can you please explain that to people? Council President Sandy, um this particular project is not requesting a TIF bond. We're only requesting the appropriate incentives that, that the city feels through our work with Baker Tilly will, will work for the project. But I do know that two of the other projects that are before you, either historically or this evening, are requesting a TIF bond. I, I may not be an expert in that area, but as I understand it, instead of, of requesting the property tax abatement, um, Todd Burning mentioned previously their partnership with the um, Bank of North Dakota. And what typically happens, as I understand it, is they'll build a portion of the project along with any of the TIF eligible aspects, so the, the demolition, the courtyard, those type of things that, that the previous project is requesting to be TIF eligible. They would use the, the Bank of North Dakota for interim financing, and then they would work with the city of Grand Forks to sell a TIF bond or you would use the bond then to go in and take out those public amenity portions of the project. Um, in other cases, I've, I've also aware that those TIF bonds can be used to basically pre-fund the property tax abatement that's anticipated. Um, again, we're not requesting that. That might be more in line with one of the previous applications that you reviewed in, in previous weeks and months. But for the particular one that the, um, the Beacon is looking for with EPIC, they would use the TIF for the demolition of the existing get building to get the brownfield to greenfield and then to you, to help pay for the public amenity portion of the project. Yeah, very good. Thank you. Mr. You bet. I, uh, yes, again, I, that's why I knew you knew the answer. I wasn't trying to say anything negative toward your project. As a matter of fact, I think uh, yours is the exact sort of project where TIF financing makes sense and the P3 or the P4 uh, for a project like that, I believe um, is an excellent way for the city of Grand Forks to help the university get a new project and get uh, significant development. $25 million, it's, it's a great concept. I really appreciate all the hard work and especially having the local developers and yourself working on it. So I, Mr. Mayor, will move approval. Thank you. Mr. Sand, do we have a second? Mr. Veen seconds. Uh, any more comments or I, questions? I got to ask one question. It's pretty small. How, yeah. how can you have an eight lane track without any seating to watch track and field runners? 
Okay, you don't have to answer that. I just want to take that into that, I'm not. He's also remember VN is a track former track athlete. Yeah. That that there would ever need to be that much seating at that. I don't we know. did in the in, indoor facility, as you're well aware, um, push forward with seating given and people's interests, and I do anticipate in some way that that will be incorporated into this project as well. So thanks for the reminder, and I'll give that back to the architects. Well, I can say that uh, I did train there my freshman year in Memorial Stadium, and it was in disrepair 20 years ago. So I'm glad that that's finally coming around and someone's going to do something with it. Uh, with that, any other comments? I hope seeing none. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. That motion carries. Thank you, Thank sir. Thank you. All right, 4.16. Introduction to ordinance and preliminary approval of plat of Northern Plains Potato Edition, a dedicating right away located in the northeast quarter of Section 5 Township 150 North Range 50 West, Well Township, Grand Forks County. Um, to this uh, motion would be to include the introduction of the ordinance. All right, do we have a motion or questions, comments on this one? Move approval. Got a motion. Was that Mr. Weigel? Yeah, motion by Mr. Weigel. Second by Mr. Veen. Any other questions or comments on this one? I believe this already went through planning. So, seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. And that is it for the action items. Number five on the agenda informational items. 5.1 is your investment portfolio summary as of September 30th. Thank you. And just uh, and 5.2 is the HR HR quarterly staffing report for the third quarter of 2020. Great, thank you. Those are on the record. Moving on, six citizen comments. Do we have any citizen comments today? Was there? We do not have in any except for the one that was included on the COVID update, okay, which was, that was attached to the there. agenda. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. We'll close citizen comments. Seeing no one in the house standing up. Moving on to seven approval of minutes and bills. All right, 7.1 is your. Bills. Vendor list. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Sandy, as usual, moves for approval. And second by Mr. Veen. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. The vendor list is approved. 7.2. And the minutes from August 3rd and 17th. We have a motion. As is, Mayor. Mr. Weber motions. Ms. Mock seconds. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Those are minutes are approved. Eight, Mr. Phelan. Uh, Mayor Botensky, I have two quick updates, good news, uh, or potential good news. I was on a city administrator call with the League of Cities late last week. Um, they anticipate that cities like Grand Forks, and remember the Prairie Dog Infrastructure Fund, we were an anticipating maybe the first bucket filling, which would be the first two and a half million uh, dollars. We were hoping for something like 14 million. Um, they anticipate that bucket being filled in December for a January payment of two and a half million dollars for cities like Grand Forks. So um, that's what they're tracking right now, you know, unless something significantly happens. So that should be positive news at the beginning of the year. And recall, um, we front loaded with our CARES funding the radio project. So we, we thought that two and a half million would go to road infrastructure or something like that. So more to come on that. The second update I heard on the CARES funding, recall we got the, the first phase of the funding. Um, through the CARES funding, um, based upon the law enforcement number of law enforcement officers, the payroll thing, um, we were waiting on the second portion. My understanding from the League of Cities is that that will be um, up for final approval in early November um, with the State of North Dakota Emergency uh, Group that approves that funding, and we are anticipating receiving an additional 1.7 million, as you recall. Um, and so if that does come to fruition, that would be another um, sum of money that I think when Maureen and I briefed that previously, that was kind of unallocated. We'd make a to be determined at that point in time. But it seems like right now there's one more significant hurdle, but there are funds that are still left over in the CARES um, that need to be distributed um, that are unspent at this point. And um, municipal funding, like we talked about, is still in the queue. So hopefully we hear something good in early November on that, Mayor and City Council. Thank you. Anytime you can come forward and tell us there's $4.2 million coming is a good day. So thank you, sir. All right, we got uh, the mayor and council member comments. So we'll open this up to council. Mr. Weigel, any comments? No, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Ms. Dockler? No, thank you. Mr. Weber? Sure. I, I look forward to when uh, the pain and challenge of COVID is behind us because there are just so many 
uh, really exciting things happening in this city. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yep. Mr. Kwame. No, thank you. Mr. Veen. Vice President Mock. No, President Sandy. Yeah, the only one thing I wanted to mention is uh, my audio has been going in and out all night. Uh, volume has been up and down. Um, I know we've spoken several times over the last couple of years about creating our technology. Um, I, I'm not sure. I know uh, IT has put some time and money into it. I think we should continue to address these issues as long as some of us are going to have to be working remotely. Thank you, Mayor. That's excellent point, especially during these times. Um, I don't have much to say. I just think, you know, we're, we're going through a, a tough time uh, right now with this virus. It's coming back on a, on a second uh, wave. We have got through the first one. I think we, as a community, need to come together. we got to keep our vulnerable population safe and keep those the hospital numbers low so that there's access to people who get sick. I mean, it's, uh, it's kind of been the same story from the start. Control the spread, keep the vulnerable population safe, and, and keep those hospitals so they have capacity, and I, you know, I really hate to see this community get torn apart by, you know, placed in any different groups. So I think we just really all need to come together and, and work at this together, and uh, we will get through this. We're going to get through this eventually, and there is a lot of, uh, a lot of optimism and a lot of bright, uh, bright things in the, in the future. So I'm pretty excited for the, the future of Grand Forks. And with that, uh, I'm going to move on and, and look for a motion to adjourn, and we can uh, get home to our families. Moved by Mr. Weber, second by Mrs. Mock. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>